Okay, can uh, you hear me okay? The back there? Yeah, great. Okay, so um, I, for one, thought that, you know, Dr. Samuels did a great job there to understand, give you an idea of, you know, why sleep is important for the athletes and how it's managed. And, um, you know, there are some regional differences we'll talk about, but there are quite a bit of similarities as well. So we're dealing with athletes. Um, we're interested in, in sleep need, but it's not just the nightly sleep need. It's, it's across the entire week, and, and we'll continue to talk about that. But there's some specific things that uh, we know about. And, of course, we can start with, um, with Ramadan. But I'll highlight basically through the talk um, just looking at uh, you know, what's the Muslim, Muslim athlete's perspective. So um, how do they view sleep? I think this is a new area for, for us to start to look at. Of course, how does uh, Ramadan influence the sleep-wake pattern? We'll continue to talk about that. And we need to start, as we've, we've heard before, uh, really starting a screening process with the athletes to understand what their habitual sleep habits are. So um, I've begun with our colleagues here at Aspatar and NSMP. We've, we've started to do this process, so I'll give you some, some information as to what we found. And um, we've heard there about actig actigraphy, so we can see using the movement watches, we can see kind of a general idea of what sort of sleep habits the athlete may have. So I'll present some slides there just to show you what we're dealing with. And um, I think it's important to bring back the point of the conference here with the recovery centers coming up. We want to know how can we uh, not just monitor sleep, but how can we maybe improve sleep um, for the, and manage the sleep issues for the athletes here in, in Qatar. So we all know what happened last year with the Olympics, Summer Olympics. Uh, we saw that Ramadan was coinciding with um, the games there. So one thing to highlight here is the perspective of what I'm trying to get us to appreciate is that with respect to Ramadan, we know that's a local issue that we need to, to understand and to, to deal with. But it's not the same for all athletes either. So we saw during the Olympics that some athletes decided to fast during uh, all days, all training days, all competition days. Some decide to fast only during training, not during competition. Some decide to fast, uh, they d delay their fast into to another time period. So it's, it's very, um, as we see with sleep, you know, we need to monitor and, and not just give everyone a general recommendation, but uh, it's very individual. So I think sleep gives us an opportunity to implement the monitoring strategies, and then if, if needed, the referral and an individual uh, treatment approach. So what we found so far in the data that we've collected here in athletes, um, it's basically been a, a very stepwise small process. Um, we started down at physiotherapy where we just collected <coughs> some very general sleep questionnaires which were not quote unquote for the athletes. They were standardized sleep questionnaires that we had in sleep medicine field. So in the first um, study basically, what we see here is that the self-reported sleep duration was reduced in the athletes attending outpatient physiotherapy. So this is the effects of Ramadan. So what we saw is that the, the pre and post uh, Ramadan duration of sleep was, was reduced. In this case, out of the nine individuals, every single one but one had a one hour reduction. So I think it's important to contrast this result from the following year where we had a larger sample. And what we see here, where we have healthy athletes during training season. So these are both football players. These are injured. These are not injured. They're training. In this case, the training athletes had a delayed sleep phase. So what I mean by this is they're able to delay, they delayed their sleep, so they skewed their sleep period. So they're able to maintain their sleep duration. But as we see here, we need to take into context the circadian influence. So how does this change in sleep schedule affect their ability to perform throughout that day or the next day's match, uh, training or match? In Qatar, we know typically with respect to Ramadan, our training times and our uh, match times are, are delayed. So this is, uh, for the majority of the athletes who, of course, are being Muslim, or Muslim in this country, that works well for them. But how do, what do we do and, and how do we implement any individual uh, strategies for the non-Muslims? Um, we need to consider that. We've also seen some data from our Dr. Cristiano here looking at uh, injuries. And we see that some of the non-Muslims actually report a higher incidence of injuries um, during Ramadan. So maybe their, their sleep schedule is, is different. And maybe this is uh, different coping mechanisms for them. But if we take this group here and we see among the phase delayed athletes, there was an increase in reporting of um, basically daytime impairment. So again, they don't have to wake up in the morning, but they still may have this residual idea of fatigue. So I think it uh, highlights this idea between not just the nocturnal sleep, but a napping strategy and making sure that they have enough total sleep time across the 24-hour period, making sure that they have what they need. Okay, so then we continue this research and we, we have moved basically from implementing some sleep questionnaire screening to basically using the actigraphy watches. So the actigraphy does have an advantage to where it's, it is not invasive to, in the case where they just have to wear it like a watch. 
and it gives us a good idea, sort of a temporal resolution, so we can look at the night-to-night -night, uh, picture, and, and it does give us a picture, which we'll see on the next slide. But um, so these particular information is looking at the sleep in adults and in youth. So I've kind of looked at both uh, self-reported data and then the objective data, which we get from the sleep um, watches. So in this case, we have the self. Uh, we have a particular questionnaire that's standardized in sleep, but not in athletes at this point. So there's a need to do that. But well, we see 19 percent of the football players have, uh, are short sleepers. So again, you know, there is a need to get enough sleep, but how much sleep is going to affect the performance? We still need, you know, need to understand this uh, for our athletes. If we look at the objective data in comparison, uh, this is at home during training. So this is just karate athletes. So in this case, we're looking at soccer players, football. This case, a small group of karate players. So we can see here the total sleep duration out of, let's say, five out of seven nights was about six hours. <coughs> and their sleep efficiency, so how much was 75%. So this is how much time they spend asleep compared to the time in bed. So we typically, in a clinical sleep world, this number should be about 85% where the person should be asleep um, for at least 85% of the sleep period. So this is kind of gives us an idea of sleep uh, quality, if you will, but um, definitely not in the case, not, definitely not as good as a clinical sleep testing. So, Again, there definitely could be differences between the athlete groups. This is something we need to consider. Again, highlighting the need for, for assessment and, and monitoring. If we move on to the youth, uh, at this point, as we've highlighted before today, uh, I think Martin did, is that the ability for the, the youth athletes to, to, to have an understanding of their, of their own timings and reporting of timings, the concordance between what they think they do and what they actually do, we've, we found in the last couple of years it's just not as good, so we, our data there we need to work on the screening tools. Um, but again, we can use the actigraphy to get a, at least to start understanding the athlete habits. So here we have uh, a group of football players in both cases. This one's during training, uh, and this one's during a training camp. So we've highlighted some possible differences there earlier today. Um, so here we see sleep in this athlete group. So this is 17-year-old uh, athletes, 7.15 hours, 80% sleep efficiency, a little bit better. Then in the training camps, this is a different group, but the same age group. Six hours uh, pre-match time and five hours post-match time. We, so we're interested in how was the sleep quality, their sleep duration affected by the match play. We've heard with football with the late timings of the match and just the endorphins and the excitement, it could be uh, difficult for them to relax and go to sleep. Um, here we have the sleep efficiency before the match, 74%, and then reduced 68%. So, Basically, some, some issues here related to you know, sleep duration, sleep quality, but again, we need to continue our monitoring process to fully understand what's going on. Okay, so this is a picture of the actigraphy in the case that what we use. So uh, what you're looking at basically is individual days going across here. Um, so the athlete just wears a watch-like device that goes into the, to the arm. Um, and so the blue here is basically act activity levels, so any sort of activity that's picked up is going to show a large, sharp uh, blue spike. And then one thing we have to do is, uh, Dr. Ch so, uh, Dr. Samuels highlighted, is that we need to also combine this, the, act, the watch with the sleep log so that we can understand what time they're getting into bed and what time they're getting out of bed to help us, uh, to help basically the software give us the data. So this pink period here is highlighting when the individual says they're getting into bed. Okay, so what I want to illustrate in this particular case is just some of the variation that we see uh, in the athletes here. So I think we alluded to that before. One of the ways we improve sleep is, is taking someone from a very variable sleep uh, pattern to a more fixed uh, pattern. And this is something that we'll need to do in you know, sort of like a special, specialist assessment and monitoring program. Um, what else can we see? When we talk about sleep efficiency being poor, so that the sleep duration in bed was, was not very much, so it was, it was reduced. We look at a night like this or like this where the individual gets into bed but they still have much, you know, too much activity and they're not able to, you know, they don't fall asleep, they don't even try to go to sleep yet. So they're in bed but not trying to sleep. So what is the effects of this um, in terms of creating poor sleep habits? We can discuss this later. Um, what else was going to highlight? Okay, so we'll move on. So the next one, and this is definitely uh, relative to living in an Islamic society, as we can see. So I think you can see a quick difference between this one and the previous graph. So in this case, we see a large spike here, 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 and usually it's almost it's a little bit delayed here. So this is, of course, the um, prayer time. So this is when the individual is waking up and doing their prayers, which can last any time from 5, 15 minutes, uh, depending on the individual. 
of course, um, this is just representative of one individual, so it's going to be variable between each athlete what their actual habits are. So in this case, we see that the timing of their sleep is quite fixed, and their wake-up time is relatively fixed, and that's quote-unquote good. But in this case, their sleep quality or their fragmentation is, is not good, and they're having periods where they're awake, not, not just awake in bed, but they're having activity, and they're, they're creating some arousal, which can um, basically alert the body to start waking up, which we don't want to do. Um, and then the last thing with respect to this is it kind of highlights that in many cases we'll see that the athletes actually have a sort of split sleep. So it's not uncommon for them to, you know, have a short, you know, three or four hour sleep period followed by a break and then another sleep period. And this again highlights we can see sometimes, not in this case, this is the watch is not on, but in many cases the, the athletes will be napping. And, and I can say in, this, in the data that I've collected, uh, napping is quite common in this culture, and um, we need to take that into consideration for the total sleep need that the athlete may be uh, required to get. So um, perhaps not requiring them to get as much sleep on a particular night, but ensuring they have a particular nap strategy to ensure they have the sleep they need to feel rested is important. So basically what we see is that in Muslim athletes, we do have some sleep disturbances that are common, but in I think we're starting to understand what sort of sleep disturbances we're dealing with uh, globally with respect to athletes. And perhaps it's not as large a, of a problem as we thought, but in our case, we saw about a quarter of the athletes have a sleep disturbance that they need to, to have addressed. And so whether or not this uh, nocturnal sleep is, is, in, is insufficient enough to affect performance, we still need further research. But we definitely have some norms for each age group that we need to consider. Um, we have an inconsistent sleep-wake pattern that we saw before, and a lot of times this is self-imposed. So, you know, we saw in the case with the prayers, but what we're seeing also in this athletes, I think we all know that everyone has, the, in this, a lot of times the athletes here locally, they have a Blackberry. And I can assure you, nine times out of ten, each time they get into bed, especially with the youth, they're on their Blackberry. They have the Blackberry behind the bed, as we heard before. It dings, they send a quick message, they continue doing this throughout uh, their sleep period. And then eventually, in some cases now, I've begun to see people who finally come to, uh, we have some work working with sports psychologists where this is one of the first questions we can ask. So we need to consider what sort of um, sleep habits they have getting into bed. And we consider this sleep hygiene. So uh, we've seen before, we've heard before about the circadian variability. So some individuals actually do want to sleep late. So in the case of the youth, it's typical for the youth to uh, not sleep until at least maybe, let's say, 11 p.m. Um, but there is individual difference. We've started to query this in the football players, and um, basically our data shows at least three quarters, about 75% of them are uh, this uh, night owl type. Um, but there are football players that we have on our teams that would be more of a neutral or morning type. So again, this is something where if we're monitoring, then we, if we need the particular uh, management, then we can provide a refer referral for that. And then I'll just highlight that in most cases, uh, currently at this point with the work that I'm doing, we see that this uh, sleep difficulty presents itself as insomnia clinically. Um, and what this means is that the individual may complain of problems falling asleep, problems staying asleep, or just feeling unrefreshed in the morning. So I'll highlight on some of the work we've been doing to try and um, pilot some strategies to improve that. Okay, so bringing it back here for the recovery center. So of course, you can design the recovery center in the way in which uh, we can have a napping strategy and have napping rooms. But in the case of nocturnal sleep, of course, in most cases, they'll be going home. So we kind of, it's a mutually excuse, exclusive thing, sleep in this recovery center. But with the naps and with the education uh, strategy, we can integrate everything. So I just had a quick, I wanted to provide some sort of framework for what I was, I was thinking from the work that we've been doing here, what we could do as an approach. Um, so this basic component, sleep monitoring, sleep education, and sleep referral, sort of the basic uh, ideas that I was going to elaborate on. So something that I've uh, been working on is this athlete sleep improvement program. We've piloted it in the uh, under-19 youth football players. Basically, this is an integrative sports science approach that involves myself um, and some sports psychologists. So what we do is we have a baseline. We go into each, in this case, a, a football club. We go in and we just do a monitoring. So in this case, we're using actigraphy with a sleep log. So we'll have a, a one-week period of assessment. And this can be done in many cases, let's say, during the early part of the season. So if we can do this at the early part, um, that would probably be advantageous. So we have the assessment. 
once we get the data back here, we start to analyze it and we can come up with our summaries that we need to give back to, to the club and to the players. Then we've designed uh, a workshop that can be given at the club. So this is an idea for which we could design some integrate the sleep aspect in the recovery center. And then again, with the monitoring, uh, we can provide this individual consultation, this individual referral process. Um, and I'll elaborate that in a moment. So what that, and another idea with respect to integrating sleep um, processes with respect to the recovery center, um, we could in include, I, I was thinking, relaxation exercises. We've heard about uh, whether the physio, who's going to play this role. Is it the physio? Is it the sports psychologist? Um, we do have sports psychologists who have been integrating these services with the athletes, and this could be an effective situation to do it in a group-based scenario, especially, for instance, after a match when um, they may be do stretch stretching after the cold water immersion, some case where there would be a period where they can lie down as a group and go through some sort of relaxation protocol. And then with insomnia, we've heard before about this idea of uh, sleep restriction. It was on a slide before, and there's ways in which um, behavioral sleep medicine, we have techniques from behavioral sleep medicine called cognitive behavioral therapy, which is specific, specific recommendations and behavioral plans and, and cognitive uh, restructuring that we can do to help individuals with insomnia. Um, so one thing I was going to say, I, I didn't have a slide here, but so we have started to implement this and what that means is, is that we've started to have some athletes coming through the sports psychology department where we can focus on this sort of approach. So I just wanted to present some general inf information about that, which is um, basically one case that we have currently is a, is a volleyball player who's come in and he's been reporting sleep difficulties for at least a year. Um, so what we needed to do was to provide an assessment. We had the session here, initial consultation. We gave the, the athlete the watch here in Aspatar. Athlete took it home, comes back each week. We can assess that and then we start to restructure the athlete's, um, basically their sleep-wake pattern so that we go from this variable sleep pattern to a more fixed pattern. And then we also implement the napping strategy so that we can get the total sleep duration that we need um, for that athlete to feel healthy. And, in the last three weeks, um, we've made considerable process. He was napping three to four hours and having difficulty sleeping, where we've now fixed that to, I think on average, about six hours of sleep at night, and then a 90-minute nap during the daytime. So uh, there's still some room to improve there. But this is in a ver course of three weeks um, and a very easy process to do. So elaborating more on what I was uh, providing some feedback for you with respect to how to integrate sleep in the recovery center, what we've been doing so far uh, is great, but we need to come up with a more validated Arabic language sleep questionnaire, which Dr. Samuels provided the work that he's done. So there's room for us to, to do some similar work here to ensure that we're looking at everything we need to. We need to look at sleep duration, nocturnal sleep duration, daytime nap habits, uh, the timing of their sleep, what sort of person they are, the night owl or the morning person. Of course, actigraphy has a role at this point just to give us some uh, a very effective way to look at the, the habits over the course of a week. Um, one thing that we'll focus on now as well is, is starting to truly understand how the athlete perceives sleep. So we want to come, we could you know, use this sort of recovery center as a way to not only provide the education, but also to start to assess some of the, some of the items with respect to sleep that we need to know. Of course, that allows us to do some research. Um, but more an applied situation, We've heard about education, I think, throughout the day, and, and that's where I think sleep has a huge role, is to provide education, and not just for the athletes, but for the NSMP staff, for the, for the physios, for the fitness coaches, uh, for the coaches themselves, and that's sort of the approach that I've been taking so far. So I think the recovery center has a great, um, uh, it's a great environment to actually provide that service. And from that, we can continue with the monitoring, continue with the referrals, and then eventually we'll get to the point here as we continue working with sports psychology and, and the sports physicians as well, to, to actually treat um, the athletes with we saw before has a huge impact on the ones that actually do have the sleep problem. So I think that's it at this point. So we don't have 10 years of, of work, but uh, hopefully we'll get there with uh, everyone's help in this room. So this is the colleagues I've been working with so far, and um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>